Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome to the Joseon History Society event. Uh, my name is Sean Han, and I am one of the event coordinator of the Joseon History Society. Uh, Joseon History Society uh, launched this project early last year uh, in the middle of COVID-19 pandemic uh, with the goal of building public resources for the study, research, and learning of Korea's past. Uh, the previous talks that we had uh, are all available from our YouTube channel. So please subscribe to our channel and uh, so that you can have access to those previous talks and uh, get updated with uh, the new contents. Uh, you can uh, simply type uh, Joseon History Society on YouTube uh, search box to find out our uh, channel. And uh, topics of previous talks have been uh, largely uh, within the category or range of pre-modern era, but we welcome uh, topics, other topics geographically and chronologically beyond uh, the scope of Joseon Dynasty or uh, pre-modern Korea. We also encourage uh, scholars working on interdisciplinary research and comparative methods to take advantage uh, to, uh, to this opportunity at uh, Joseon Society, Joseon History Society, I'm sorry, to address uh, their work to a wider, wider audience. Before I hand over the floor to our today's speaker, uh, Lee Song Hee, uh, allow me to introduce her and her work. Dr. Lee Song Hee uh, earned her PhD from uh, Korea University in 2021, and she is currently a uh, research professor at Korea University in the Outreach Center for Korean Linguistic, Literary, and Culture Studies, or 국제 한국 언어문화 연구소. Uh, Dr. Lee's doctoral dissertation. Uh, was titled Noron Nangnongge Yuli Juche Hongsongwa Chonge, the formation and uh, secularization of Liu Confucian self of the school of Noron Nangnon in late Joseon Korea, which restores the linguistic contact of moral politics of Liu Confucian theory on human nature or Shimsongnon in late Joseon Korea. Uh, centering on the Neo Confucian theory of the acquisition of moral agency. She tracks the intellectual debates on the metaphysical foundation of human nature in tandem with the shifting royal and court rhetoric on political legitimacy. Her research interests focus on the relation between neo Confucian moral philosophy and political rhetoric in Joseon, bridging modern and pre modern ideas of political agency in Korea and major linguistic turns in late Joseon related to Ming loyalism, uh, Daemyeongwiri and uh, Chungyeokshibi and the introduction of Western learning in Korea. Uh, Dr. Lee Song Hee uh, recently organized a conference, the first annual conference of the, uh, the center. She's currently affiliated with the title uh, Now and Future of Global Korean Studies. And uh, while she was a doctoral student, she was also a, a doctoral fellow uh, at, in the Rich Institute for Chinese and Western Cultural History in 2019. So today's uh, talk, uh, Song Hee's talk is titled, uh, Yeolnyo to Female Martial Heroes, the Changing Subjecthood of Neo-Confucianist moral agency in late Joseon Korea. Uh, Song Yi's talk will be about 30 to 40 minutes length. And after her talk is done, uh, then we'll have about 30 minutes of a QA and a session. Without further ado, uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Song Hee. Thank you, Shen. Yeah, thank you for having me here today. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm really grateful. Uh, I'm really thank you for having me here on what is becoming a popular forum and as to present one's research on Joseon. I got my PhD last summer on how neo-Confucian theories on subjecthood and moral agency have become political rhetoric in late Joseon. What I'll talk about today is basically extension of my dissertation. 
I will talk about the transition of Yeolya to female martial heroes, so-called Yeosong Young in Korean, appeared in fictional stories by way of relating it to the broader intellectual history of late Joseon. So let us dive in. What is Yeolya? What does prefix Yeol in Yeolya refer to? Yeol signifies a quality of commitment unwavering and steadfast in the face of hardship and adversity. Compared to other cardinal Confucian virtues such as loyalty, it is gentle neutral in that it is a quality of being steadfast to the point of death. It is generally assigned to men defying death in pursuit of righteous cults. It is therefore a moral quality reserved for both sexes and frequently, but not always, accompanied death by suicide. Yolya therefore means fulfilling the only pathway of virtue reserved for women that is a sexually monogamous and dutifully attendant to all in-laws. In the book Samgang Hengsilto, one could find the description of what entitles one to be Yolya. This is a picture of Lady Kwon. As you see, uh, she leaped off a cliff against these Japanese soldiers threatening her chastity. As you all may know, following the two catas catastrophic wars in the 16th to 17th century, the trope of Yalya embracing death for sexual chastity against foreign enemies made appearance. This tendency is thought to be driven by the governing elites to double down on neo-Confucian orthodoxy and drive it down to the lower social strata by means of proliferating official rewards and sanctions. In so doing, the neo-Confucian elites crafted the post-Ming loyalist ideology under the Qing supremacy. Under these women were defined exclusively by their relationship to patriarchal authority. It is in this context that Korean women faced certifying moral subordination in the domestic setting and exclusion from public space. Yeolya is thought representative of the patriarchal oppression Korean women suffered under the Confucian governing ideology in Joseon period. Usually referring to the prohibition of female remarri remarriage, if not taxi, taxi endorse endorsement of wife's suicide following the death of her husband, this social practice was broadly a point of pride and was boasted of to the extent they often mentioned it when they were communicating with Chinese elites when they visit China as a member of embassies. The quotes in the slides are from Hong Dae-yong and Yu de Kung, two prominent so-called Shirak scholars outlining the social norm in an approving manner. Although in Yu de Kung's passage, it is not entirely clear whether he considers it a custom passage age. In the first quotation, Hong Dae-yong answers what worshiping Jushi and chaste widows who never remarry is the well-established customs in Joseon. In the second quotation, Yu de Kung also says, because all the Joseon widows never remarry, one can never be Yolya unless she follows her husband to death. The Chinese counterpart re replies, Following one to the grave is an evil practice that should never be praised. Yu Duk Gung has nothing to this, com this comment, so he might silently agree with it, but in the records of travels of Korean embassies to China, we can frequently find that chosen elites proudly boasting a wife's killing themselves to prove her commitment to chastity. So why was this significant? How could we contextualize and interpret this highly gendered expectation? In this presentation, I argue that this, in fact, marks a broad and substantial conceptual shift in the neo-Confucian understanding of ethical subjecthood that increasingly encompassed increasingly encompassed women in such a way that explicitly ascribed moral and political agency. Although by no means a full enfranchisement or social parity in line with our contemporary expectation of what female agency ought to look like, this represents a thinking tied in with human moral capacity previously accessible to only men and men of certain social position. As we will see, this conceptual enlargement is largely intelligible within the three intersecting contexts. First, 
the two words that shook the foundation of Joseon dynasty in the 16th and 17th century, Imjin War of Hideyoshi invasion and Byeongja War of Manchu invasion. Secondly, the factional competition in the royal court. And lastly, the related debates circling around the human mind and the side of ethical judgment. It was this philosophical emphasis on the human mind or shim as a universal judge of moral determination that gained political dominance. Therefore, we could also identify intellectual conceptual reasons for this. They are to do with the 17th century debates on the metaphysical foundation of human nature in the juicy vein to which Korean neo-Confucians translately subscribed, gradually narrowing on the problem of cognition and agency, hence that of motivation. And if the cornerstone of this neo-Confucian philosophical framework was human mind, juicy is common in passing here, which means the only difference between human and animal is the way of using mind. This phrase produced endless debates over the 300 years from 16th century onwards in Joseon. The Korean commentators in 18th century in particular took this to be at the heart of Jewish philosophy. In other words, what motivates the human mind that, app that apparently separates out external sensation from moral faculty, thereby trying to give coherence to human moral agency? The whole debate on the metaphysical foundation of human agency, which had its conceptual basis in human cognition and whose hands were moral obligation and motivation was the heart of 17th century Joseon intellectual landscape. As we'll see, the grinding war of attrition for doctrinal orthodoxy was won by those that maintained human mind is entirely of key. It was this school of thought that came to preeminence in late Joseon. I will provide a quick summary of this debate. So here's the family tree of Joseon neo-Confucian schools. Political factions are more or less interchangeable with schools of thought in this case. First, there was two giants, Taege Yi Hwang and Yulgok Yi. All the Joseon schools, after, all the Joseon scholars afterwards basically thought they are descendants of one of the two, that you can find them even in today's Korean banknotes. Here you can see Yi Hwang in 5001 and Yi in 1001. The first plate happened through Sadan Chilzong Lunjing, a debate about the source of the good in human nature. The debate gave birth, gave birth to the two schools. School of Taege became Namin, and School of Yi became Seoin. Namin came by Yi Wang, and the Seoin came by Yi Yi. Namin argued that human mind was a composite reality between Li, a region with capital R, which I would qualify as the universal pattern Im imminent in human mind, and Ki, which could be described as a phase matter. This was Yi Huang's position. Yi Huang thought the good human traits are the self-manifesting expression of Li. Yi challenged, challenged this view, suggesting that the mental operation of human mind and psychological emotions are the process of Qi because Li is more like conceptual ideal, never corporeal. They maintained that human mind was entirely key, that it was a specific phase configuration with no part played by internal region. Science position was the dominant in the late chosen court politics, and this thought stream is what it followed. Unsurprisingly, the Soin camp itself went through further, fact further factualization. From late 17th century to the early 18th century, they split into Noron and Soron over the interpretation of the Confucian canons. Noron blamed Soron for not following Jewish teaching. This was a time of deadly political purges at its peak in late Chosan. And finally, Nurun divided into Horun and Dangrun in, in 18th century, named Horak debate. It was a discussion over the mental status of Shim mind and the role of human cognition and perception. And what they had in view together was the question on moral subjecthood and agency. 
These three centuries long debate could be broadly characterized as conceptual efforts to determine and qualify what ethical attributes make us human in a full sense, equipped with adequate faculties, psychological makeup, and conceptual resources to navigate and drive within the sphere of community. If the initial disagreement was prompted by the differing conception of what distinguishes humans from intelligent animals, final destination Horak debate was how and what operations of mind make us fully human. With the proposition that mind is, the, is this position taken, taken for granted, what confronted the dominant school of thought was reserving in what manners and to what extent human mind has access to this region. That is actually outside the mind. By way of cognitive and psychological means, no longer strictly bound to the metaphysical domain. Because according to broadly held sewing perspective, mind was thought to be entirely of key that also materializes and conceals into physical matters like rocks, animals, and human mind. It was crucial to make a distinction on the basis of which ethical judgment unique to human mind could be made distinguishable from mere beasts. It should be noted that many scholars were indeed open to the possibilities of animals also having some limited moral capacities and, demonst and demonstrating virtuous behaviors. Nangnong Kemp paid close attention to cognitive faculties and the research on psychological state as the evaluative basis of moral judgment, whereas Horon Kemp placed emphasis on the limitation of corporeal reality that mind, no matter how well aware, cannot carry out moral righteousness. Therefore, if mind is a dynamic specification of key and not a composite reality rooted in the universal region, we, it appears theoretically that no one is off limit to the enactment of moral righteousness. The presence of the human mind alone was the key metric and not whether it is more formed, deformed and cultivated. Even the lowest and the most marginalized could fulfill the moral ends expounded by the neo-Confucian orthodoxy. One could do good regardless of one's physical determination by the sex, uh, sex, personality, or social position. In so doing, placing moral possibilities on the domain of mind provided the agency. And this agency became the key determinant in assessing the morality of conduct. So let us take a step back from this bewildering set of ideas. What did the female thinkers make of all this? I chose two and only contemporary female neo-Confucian thinkers, Im Yun born in 1721 and Dai in 1793, and Kang Dong born in 1772, Dai in 1832. Most women were under the influence of Nang Nun, of course, Im Yun Jidang was a sister of Im Songju, the most authoritative Nangno scholar in late 18th century. Kang Dong Il Dang was also from Nangno family and has social network with influential Nangno scholars like Hong Jik Pil, though her husband followed Horon. It seems Kang Dong Il Dang admired Im Yun Jidang as a role model, and she frequently quotes Im Yun Jidang's words. They are drawn to the implication that normal human beings and the sages in position of the same mind and with a view to pursue the same ends are to be seen and appreciated for their moral capacities. In Yun Jidang's posthumous publication captures this notion. In Yun Jidang Yugo, she writes, even though humans differ, their essence is the same. It is the mixture of unclear and tawdry or muddy that gives rise to normal human beings. Alas, though I may be a lowly woman with low intellect, endow endowed with the identical nature and, character and characteristics as men, I desire the same as the sages. Likewise, Kang Zhong Il Dang quotes Im Yun Jidang to the effect that Though I qualify myself as a woman, yet I am endowed with the same nature and ought to strive to become the sage. In other words, in spite of gender differentiation, the endowment with the same nature to which human mind is predisposed allows women with the effort to reach the sagehood. 
And just in case all this sounds strikingly liberal and egalitarian, I want to point out this was a very specific, if dominant, stream of thought. For instance, Eek, the famous so-called progressive Shirak scholar, held a negative position on the benefits of female education. In this quotation, he says, Twege writes that it is best to keep women uneducated because what they learn will only sharpen their twisted wits enough and arrive only at incongruity. It suffices to note that teaching them right and wrong will not be put into practice and will only cause harm. And she says, so she, she never teaches her daughter like literature. So some Twege scholars held the Moral agency is entirely dependent upon one's position, not determined by the motivation behind the action. It seems E thought the basis of moral realization is to keep faithful to one's right position. The virtue of women was to obey, so any kinds of behavior that exceeds social norm for women can be evaluated. Women suffer from the absence of agency of power, in other words. So how does this conceptual shift that I, that I outlined map onto the literary characters of martial heroines? I will spend the remaining time explaining how these literary figures thematize the conceptual change that says moral agency within the human mind. The notable female martial heroes make a trend in 19th century in fictional genres in Joseon. There were stories written in vernacular Korean like Kim Si Buin Jeon, Jung Soo Jung Jeon, or Hong Ge Wil Jeon. But the reason I introduced you the two synthetic narrative, Yuk Bidangi and Ung Lumung, is that they were both written in renowned elite Yangban writer at the time, and they both show a huge interest in female agency of loyalty to the king. The question they pose are as follows Can women conduct action definable as loyalty? Are their actions and behaviors entitled to be praised as being loyal? Let us bear in mind that the act of loyalty could transpire exclusively in the hierarchical relational context of king and official. The duty of loyalty was conceivable within the context of king and his officials, while hyo or filial piety arises within parents and children. And since women were barred from civil servant exams, it was technically impossible for women to be loyal. There is no formal situation where women are expected to carry out a moral duty to be loyal to her superior. Her superiors exist only in the familiar framework. The item of virtues available to women were either hyo or yeol, meaning unwavering commitment to the righteous cause, and in this context, her marriage. The ambiguity of her position invited an open-ended question. Can women decide out of her own will? Emblematic of this is the phrase 중심 불사 이군, 열려 불, 불경 이부. That is to say, a royal subject never served two sovereigns and a chaste woman never married twice. If there is a meaningful analogy between the king official and the husband and wife, and husband and wife relationship in that they both exist voluntarily, it also indicates that women, though her own will, could potentially perform the obligation of loyalty. Unlike the parents and children relationship that is involuntary, the phase, in, uh, the phase implies that the first two are of one's own making. The commonplace notion, Queen Bu Jeonjeejiwi, wives cannot make her own decisions, denies this, of course, saying women does not choose to whom she submits herself because she ought to follow in the course of her life her parents, her husband, and her son. Therefore, it was increasingly unclear in the wake of officially recogni recognizing the verses during the Japanese invasion, how to interpret the case of Nongye. As is well known, Nongye, a lowly government entertainment slave, is known for her plunge to death while embracing a Japanese general during the Hideyoshi invasion. But in deciding Nongye's action, on what ground was she to be memorialized? Is it loyalty or fidelity? By the official them generated interesting debates. Nongye was not married, so she could not be praised for her chastity. 
Nor was she an official, but a lowly person of servitude. She had no standing moral obligations. If a woman in the state of servitude chooses, what can she choose? Did Nonge act out of loyalty? But to whom? On what moral ground could her action could be evaluated? The conceptual tension was evident. She was finally acknowledged as righteous Kiseng, or Ri Ki, here. After more than a hundred years, she couldn't be named Chung or Yeol. Instead, the name Wigi connotes that a female could participate in king and official relationship. The reassessment of her case nearly 100 years later, reversing the initial reservation was not separable from the wider factional battle in the royal court called Chungyeok Sibi. The debate increasingly grew from a narrow category of political rhetoric, often in order to vindicate or vilify each other's ancestral house. During the reign of Yangzhou and Zhongzhou, the rhetoric use of Chung came into sharp focus when there was a political imperative to calm the factional war. Let us finally turn to the analysis of the characters in question, where it is evident that this tension was reserved. I will examine the two novels, two stories, Yung Midangi and Ong Lumu, both written, both written in the 19th century Joseon. The government never allowed female loyalty even for Dongye, but female characters were called as loyal subjects in those stories. Here's the brief synopsis of the two stories. Uh, both stories feature martial heroines who acquired fantastic powers from a mysterious hermit from suffering hardships. They go to wall, save the emperor and their men. The two quotations are found in the similar part of the narrative, where the female characters faced with the predicaments receive military and special training become martial heroines. However, the characters differ in their goals. In Yung Mi Dangi, the mentor of the heroine, Lady Beck, says, Kum Yo Ku, Wang Yin Se, Jin Jin Su Hak, Jil Yok Puguk, Sang Kai, An Sajik, which means, now you hurry back to your world, practice what I taught you to save your homeland with almost endeavor. Then you can achieve what you want, protecting your emperor, subduing the rebellion, and rejoining your parents. And please don't forget the promise you made with your fiancé. What the Taoist priest recommends in the virtue of Chungyo, suitable for the literary male, marries with her man, Susan, is mentioned only as the last item here at the very end. In contrast, in Umlumu, the motivation of the heroine is completely different. When Kang Namung refused to learn martial power, her mentor suggests, Ya, you, Kogukji Pyonhaya. That is to say, if you want to go back home in this time of turmoil, learn these few skills to find your way back. Their subsequent conducts differ in words. Lady Beck in Yungmi Dangi avoids marriage even if her fiancé insists on it. Kang Namun in Ong frequently reminds readers of whole femininity, stressing her physical vulnerability and gentle personality in the narrative. The most telling difference is the way their military feats and martial valors are, are narrated. After the, the disclosure of her female identity, Lady Beck in Yungmi Dangi wrote to the emperor that she had done everything for him. And the emperor adopted her as a daughter and replied, you are my subject outside the court and my dear daughter inside the court. This comes about in response to Lady Beck's assertion that she hid her, her identity to the very end and performed her duty. Interestingly, the emperor notes that king and of soul being equal to father and son relationship and as such, asks her to press on with her works. In Umumu, the heroine constantly reminds herself that it was for her husband that she was to all. She says, 도독이 금야 불행즉 국가 안위를 오하지지며 
삼군 진태를 오하 찰지리오. Which means, if my husband dies, what on the earth do I care the fate of the empire or the battle? Similarly, after her true identity is revealed, she immediately withdraws into the woman's place, never to be seen again. Instead, her husband speaks to the emperor on her behalf, saying, 언기 본이즈 불과 종 부이연이오니, which means her real intention was to follow her husband and nothing else. So she doesn't need any position in the court. The reason why these female martial heroes could be called Chungjin or royal official is not related, is not unrelated to the prolif proliferation and rhetoric excesses of the time in which everyone demanded their own potential for loyalty. Women, in as, in as far as they could be considered one, had to be at least ambiguous. Lady Beck ostensibly fulfills the duty of loyalty and is portrayed as such, whereas Kang Namung's war efforts are described as a mission to her husband. In other words, So Yu Young, the writer of Yung Mi Dangi, opposed the idea of female loyalty, and Da Myung Ru, the writer of Ong Lu Mung, reassigned as extinction of female virtue of Yal. One could guess that So Yu Young sought to limit his female measure hero within the boundary of, yeah, uh, I mean, Na Myung Ru, so to limit the female martial hero within the boundary of Yeol. This increased usage is normalized so much so that even persons of illegitimate lineage, Seoul, and the middling people, Jungin, could make these claims. This was all the more pronounced with the gradual ideological blending of proming and domestic controversies of loyalty and enfranchising women as political subject in terms of loyalty would be not outrageous at this point. Indeed, adjacent, adjacent virtues such as filial beauty, hyo or yeol, arguably underwent similar trends. Not on faction in power by radically widening the possibility of ethical fulfillment to virtually everyone, unleashed the disruptive force in Joseon society. Such a move certainly prompted Jung Ya Gyung to take critical tone for supposedly increasing perverse practices such as bodily mutilation for kid official endorsement and tax exemptions. Nonetheless, in, oppos in opposition to the vision of highly prescriptive social ordering, the metaphysical framework with a view to centering mind as the core of moral personality is striking. The warrior-like heroines found in Seo Young's novels are to be situated in the conceptual stream. So by way of conclusion, the political thought of late Joseon from 17th to, 18th to 19th century could be described as a dissemination and popularization of the notion of ethical agency open to all and unfolded by the human mind. The philosophical debate surrounding the moral status of the human mind is, te is testimony to this twist and turn. The in intensification and excessive usage of loyalty as a political category was certainly driven by the political and, and ideological need, reflecting the warring factions in the cold and the unhappy adjustment to the reality of Qing supremacy. One of the consequences of this was the destabilization of the conceptual underpinning that more or less maintained the gender and social class stratification. By allowing the participation in the moral good in the Confucian orthodox thinking, the idol of loyalty beyond the narrow cadre of male Yangban class became accessible to the wider chosen populace. Often dismissed as a scholastic tendency comparable to a bondry European medieval preoccupations, the intellectual legacy of this, these three centuries long debates is little discussed and even less understood. In this talk, I wish to highlight the tremendous conceptual imprints that this discussion had made and the interesting directions they took. As a result of wholesale dismissal in the 20th century, we are left with distorted and uneven accounts of social, political, sexual, and intellectual history of late Joseon. We have yet to have a convincing account of how the conceptual transference from dynastic monarchy to the artificial representation sovereign state. 
In Pascal assessing the, neo the neo-Confucian heritage that informed how modern Koreans moralize their relationship with the state, including the rights and obligations, cannot be fully understood without reference to this intellectual legacy. The violent transition to 20th century modernity may not have entirely extinguished the idea of loyalty, an interpersonal or personalized virtue. And at the moment, it is unclear how or whether Chung and Ego reconciled with each other. It is time that we should reconsider the scholarly commonplaces that customarily reject the national association between modern Korea and this Confucian legacy. That's all of my talk. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Songhee. Yeah, that was a fantastic talk. Yeah, I'm really thrilled to hear about this uh, research on full of understanding of gender, even within uh, the pre-modern uh, framework of uh, your intellectual debates and all together. And uh, again, let's give another uh, big round of applause to Songhee. Thank you. And yeah, uh, now we will have a Q&A session. And I'm sure that uh, everyone uh, in this room are uh, excited to share their response, uh, just like me, and hear uh, more from her. So we'll have about 30 minutes of question and answer time. And uh, you can raise question uh, or your uh, response in two ways. Uh, first, uh, you can uh, use the raise hand function on the, the bottom bar of this Zoom screen. And another way of communication is to use the chat box. You can uh, type down your response or question uh, either to everyone or just to me, if you want to keep those uh, feedback or questions anonymous, and I will read them all, all together out, out loud so that everyone can also uh, uh, hear from those questions, okay? Um, yeah, so let's begin. Okay, I understand the like all the metaphysical, philosophical discussions are really unfamiliar with you. Yeah. So I'm afraid I make it clear. So well, as the uh, moderator of this session, I would like to use my privilege to ask the first question. So, uh, I have a question about the title that you shared. So you used the word yoryo, um, and I was wondering uh, if was was there a particular reason you used this word uh, instead of using a uh, kind of English word like chastity or uh, chastise a woman as a kind of a way to translate it? Oh, I think yoryo is a historical phenomenon, basically. Well, we also have yoryo in China, but in late Joseon, it was kind of so slowly like booming that a lot, tons of yoryo were produced actually. So I think it is more accurate to say yoryo instead of just chaste woman. Thank you for that answer. Can I, can I ask? Yes, um, please, Jin Young. Okay, yeah. okay. okay. Um, uh, Dr. Lee, is, I really thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation, especially your ex explanation linking the Confucian uh, philosophy and um, the novels together and show us um, how, um, how the rhetoric and culture of Yeolyeo was built building into some period. One thing I'm wondering is that uh, your title is from Yeolyeo to uh, female martial heroes, martial heroes. So can you explain a little bit more about the ma female martial heroes 
uh, which which uh, who share uh, the same um, virtues of Yarnyo. First. Oh, yeah. Thank you for the question. Well, actually, I really learned a lot from your your your, your paper, like you wrote a few years ago, and I, I really got some ideas from it. And to answer the question, can I share my slide for a moment? Yep. Yes, please do so. Okay. Give me a second. Yeah, um, the, the linkage between Yeolyeo to martial hero is from this passage, 충신 불사 이분, 열려 불편 이부. Well, as I mentioned in presentation briefly, the king and official relationship is quite similar to husband and, and wife relationship because they are both, uh, both the result of of a personal choice, actually. Well, of course, a woman can never choose her husband by herself, but anyway, it's not something like inborn, inborn linkage, like parents and children. So in this phrase, we can logically think that husband and wife relationship is similar to that of king and official relationship. And in some, if a woman can can secure her chastity for her husband, theoretically, she can also do, uh, she, she can be also loyal to something, uh, something bigger valuations like the king or monarch. So that's the reason why I said from Yeolyeo to Yeosong Yeongwon. Thank you. Uh one more question. Uh, I have one more question. Usually, um, in a novel, uh, the female master heroes in uh, the vernacular novels, actually, they they were loyal to their state, but they were not loyal to their actually husbands. Yeah. Not really. So, uh, can you explain uh, about that? Because they seem that Yalya is usually uh, actually they were kind of symbol of loyalty but they usually show their loyal to their husband. But in, in terms of female martial heroes, actually they change their uh, royal um, object. So why this kind of change happened in the novels? Well, that is really hard question to answer for now. Uh, and you mentioned uh, the novels, the stories you mentioned are usually written in vernacular Korean and in the stories written in Korean, then the Semitic literature, it seems they are go far. The Yungmi Dangi and Ungnomung I introduced you today, they are both basically written by um, by Yangban male Yangban male writers, and they seem to well maybe. Namunlu is afraid of something that that female can be go too far away, but I think in stories written in vernacular Korean, they are more more. Well, I don't know. Well, maybe women or commoners can write about can can could could write the stories, and they are much more. They are under much less restrictions, maybe. If so, I think, yeah, we can see more potential potential for, for female moral agency in those stories. So that's what I'm going to search for next project. Hey, thank you. So uh, Su Jin Hyun has a question. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you for your interesting uh, uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, I have a question that uh, you suggested the materials based on 17th century. So I can understand that what the concept of uh, the Yeolya 
uh, was and the, what kind of uh, the, the uh, ideology the neo-confucianism was uh, linked to linked to the concept of failure. So uh, it was very uh, useful, uh, not useful, but <laughs> I'm so I'm, I, I'm so uh, uh, interested in that. Uh, so, uh, but I was wondering that. Uh, uh, I, I major in Korea Dynasty, the uh, the right before Joseon Dynasty, and uh, in uh, in Goryeosa, the the history of Korea, the um, uh, published in the very early early in the Joseon Dynasty, there is also uh, Yeolyeojeon. So uh, the, in Yeolyeojeon, um, there are some uh, they introduced uh, the the cases the cases of Yeolye. Uh, in Goryeo Dynasty, so actually it was published in Joseon Dynasty. So, uh, of course, uh, we have to uh, consider uh, that that uh, we have to consider that uh, the the uh, in the concept of uh, Goryeo Seolya, there there will be some uh, uh, that some Joseon 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 the intellectuals of Joseon's. Uh, perspective will be affected uh, to the Korea, uh, that the Korea's are, of course, but uh, but uh, also we have to understand that that materials are from actually the the record of Joseon Dynasty. So uh, what I, uh, what I what I'm wondering uh, is that uh, that could you explain the when the when the the concept of Yeolya was formed and then what kinds of intellectuals was affected the original Yolyo or uh, something like this. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry for uh, actually uh, here, uh, uh, it was night, so I turned off my camera. And I'm sorry for my, like, uh, yeah, this is, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for the question. Well, uh, I there are already a really great previous study on the subject, like, uh, can I tell it? When you read Dr. Kang Myung-gwan's Yeolyeo's Tanseng, this book, uh, this book captures the changing notion of Yeolyeo from Korea Dynasty to Joseon. Well, according to him, uh, uh, till early Joseon Dynasty, maybe 15th, or early 16th century, a woman can be called Yeolya, just not getting remarried after her, her husband's death. But after the two catastrophic wars in Jinaran and Byeongja Huran, there were, you know, it was the war and and women are really threatening their lives and, and or, or chastity or, or whatever. So there are a lot of women who had to die. And with this social background made made the yeolya like really relate to societal or societal or, or, or societal behaviors. Yep. And interestingly, uh, when we read like Yu Yang's Yeolyeojeon written in very ancient China, it's actually much more much more like diverse than what you think about Yeolya. It, con it, contain, it contains stories of women and call them uh, storage women, but not just focusing on wives who kill themselves. Yeah, so, well, so I think, yeah, this Yeolya phenomenon in Joseon, in, in late Joseon is something, something unique, maybe, yeah. Uh, thank you for the answer. And uh, can I uh, can I raise one more question? Uh, so uh, uh, I'm just wondering that uh, the are there were there any differences between the early early type of yolya and the late of type of late type of yolya? And then uh, were there any uh, ideological differences between them? So yeah, I I was yeah, I'm wondering about that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And interestingly, in very late 19th century or early 20th century, there are a new type of yeolya really close to this female martial heroes that there's a story of women who, who went to 
uh, uh, whose husband was, uh, whose husband died in Bungak Mungmin Zhenjing. And she, she went to the long way to find the corpse of, of her husband and bring him back to her, her to, to his hometown to bury. But when she finally found the body of her dead husband, she found out that her husband may did something wrong because there was some valuable like gold and like jewelries in his bodies that he should not uh, he, he can't have so he so she thought her husband should don't should have done something wrong then she just stopped what she was doing and just leave his leave his 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 husband's body there and go back to her hometown by herself and in this story it is like it's really weird because she she just did not obey to his to to her husband. Instead, he just he he, he thought something public values are more important. Yep. So this kind of phenomena is is there in very late nineteenth century or early twentieth century. Thank you very much. Sungi, can I also ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah, the, the last episode that you just told us about this, uh, the husband who found yeah, yeah. out to be something, uh, doing dubious thing during the war, instead of doing his duty for fighting against the foreign enemies. Uh, I wonder where did you find those stories? So it was also kind of in the form of kind of popular novels or in kind of modern no, no, type it, of newspapers? No, no, no. It was also uh, written by a scholar of Nangrun fiction. And it is collected in his in his like collection, yeah. Literary collection. Can, yeah, yeah. I can name it if you just imagine me. <laughs> um, yeah, I also have a one, the question. Um, actually, 99.9% percent of your legend was were written by male uh, literati. And um, did you mention uh, Im Yun Jidang? Actually, she wrote uh, Yeolyeojeon as well. So I wonder, uh, the Yeolyeojeon written by female um, the women, or if, uh, if Yeolyeojeon written by uh, women uh, were different, uh, have had different narrative from the Yeolyeojeon written by literati? Well, I'm not sure. Well, the work is is uh, the work of Im Yun Jidang is so small, and so we don't have a lot of her work. What we have is just a really little portion of the work. And from that, well, I don't know, but but I think I have to re-examine that. She actually the last episode you you mentioned actually show us like. Uh, there is a change of uh, Nangnon literati's mind. Actually, there, there is a change of the concept of Yeolyeo in Nangnon literati's mind. Is it uh, common in 19th century or only a small portion of literati thought about Yeolyeo differently? Well, I think it was just only a small portion of them thought so. Uh, I think. As I mentioned in the presentation, like scholars like E E, e really dislike the education of women. And I think there was a kind of popular attitude. But the Nangron people who was who lived in Seoul and relatively from wealthy families, I think they have some change in their view in women. Thank you. So you mean uh, the only Nangnun uh, is generous to <laughs> women? You mean well, that? Well, I'm not sure, but so far <laughs> I think so, but but I'm not sure about that. I have okay. to read other materials to answer the question. Okay, thank you.
So, hi, I have a question. So thank you for your interesting talk. I have questions. So I, I read some article and books like from so Professor Park Ju, and then I saw that that's is like the the numbers like of Yolo is quite different in different province, and usually like Gyeongsando, so they have like really huge lumber, like like flow out the Joseon Dynasty. Could you tell me why why the lumber of of Yolo is quite different in like among different province in Korea during the Joseon Dynasty? And oh, then maybe. why the uh, sorry? And then why the reason like Gyeongsando and then you know specific like Andong or Sanju, so the lumber of Yolo is quite like the lumber is just like is quite different or like the biggest lumber is much much more than other province. Could you mind to explain a little bit more about this? Thank well, you. Well, maybe maybe that's because the Gyeongsang province is the most devastated place during the Imjin Weran. And you know, a, a lot of Yalya is from the, the Imjin Weran. They were killed by the, the Japanese soldiers. That can be one reason. And the other reason is, it's just my guess, very rough guess, but uh, Gyeongsang province is a place where Namin people live mostly. And Namin people thought the, the core, like, the practice of morality is based on one's one's duty, on, on doing one's duty, instead of just just jumping over the line of female female virtues. They thought females should do what females have to do. I think that's the kind of naming people thought. So maybe that can be a reason, but it's just a simple guess. But I think the influence, the influence of the wall. Im Jin is the main reason why there are so many earlier. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Also, I think the time's up. We can have uh, one or two more questions before we wrap up. So when, while others are thinking about questions, I can ask one more. Uh, so I think it's uh, very important to think about these kind of social uh, factors, like uh, the actual war, this kind of extreme violence is the kind of uh, kind of driving factor of how these ideologies and discourse kind of really flourishes at uh, certain moments. And I think this is also the kind of the case, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I just uh, read some books that talks about the idea of chastity in China uh, was also kind of uh, taking its kind of peak moment when uh, uh, Han Chinese dynasty was facing foreign invasion, particularly the, the period transition from Song dynasty to Vien dynasty. There was lots of kind of uh, stories that was published during that time and also uh, Ming uh, Qing transition. And in the kind of similar manner, I, I wonder, uh, so after the Manchu and Hideyoshi invasion, probably the next kind of uh, foreign threat was in the 19th century. And I don't know if that's the kind of the, the far stretch of your research focus, but I wonder if you find something uh, also touches on uh, that particular period in terms of making of female martial heroes or their narratives against these new threats, new threats in the 19th century. Well, maybe, yeah, maybe, because in 19th century, the Joseon elites, Joseon literary, really feels the threat from outside, outside this Chinese Chinese world, like from well, well, they really are aware of the threats from the West, and maybe that is one reason why there was this kind of martial hero stories, not just female martial heroes, the male martial hero stories were really abundant in late Joseon period, so 
or maybe it's just uh, influence of Chinese stories coming to Korea because in late to some people really love to read stories and they read a lot of stories imported by China and a lot of them were like these heroic stories not just female heroes but male hero stories so they can be also on one region thank you I think uh, Ming Shan Chan has yeah, another I'm question. Sorry. So, Please do yeah, so. I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I still have some questions. I like so, so thing about it. Okay. So this is like the, the first more textbook was like well, compiled in King Sejong. So, and then I wonder when they choosing the cases, like like they are you're okay. So they will yeah. they, when they like try to compile the books, I'm gonna hang to So any like special why those cases were selected for the book? Like why they will be like representative cases, so for like putting into the book, like for for educating people, and then my second question is, like when they selecting the people and I want them to be like yellow, is there any like criteria why those cases will be select why why those women will be selected yellow? Is there any like specific like legal code or like criteria why those women why those behavior will be can be rewarded to be yellow? Yes, yeah, so that's my question. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Oh, I think uh, there are really a lot of previous studies on that actually. So uh, my answer is just summarizing that <laughs> from now on. Um, yep, yeah, the books has on edited and published. The selected people there, not just Yeolia, but Hyoja or Chungjin, they are mostly from Chinese classics. And Sejong thought they need to print, print it and educate people. That was the first publication of Samgang Heng uh, But after the Imjin invade the, the, the War, uh Gwang Hegun decided to make another Samgang Heng like including the Korean, earlier Korean Hyoja and Korean Chungshin, because well, it was the result of the war. People really died, and the government should like, how can I say, the government should make the uh, well, government should memorize them and commemorating them. That's why the Kang Egun tried to make the the another edition of Sangang Heng Well, this well, I don't remember I don't remember correctly, but I think the book was not published because the dethrone of the Kang Ye. But after that, yeah, yeah, and after that, the new version of Dong Ku. Samgang Hensito was finally published like a few decades years later. And this includes a lot of Korean Yeolyeo and Hyoja and Chungshin. And most of them are from the Imjin War to commemorating them. And if you want to know about it more further, you can find a lot of sources, the previous, the previous studies, so. Okay, so yeah. actually my question is, is there any like criteria when they selecting the cases like they they would like to put into the books like the more textbook like say like and you said like the one in like like you you know there's a, they keep thing like publish a different moral textbook so I'm just wondering like when they select the cases any like special criteria they will base on those criteria oh, when oh, they select yeah, yeah. The cases yeah they they demanded some evidences. Well, you should, um, but you know, making Yolya is more like a family business or more than a family. It's just a kind of, what, a reasonable interest. Like local governments really, really wanted to make, make someone, someone Yolya or Hyoja and get some praise from the government. So they selected like the candidates of Yeolyeo or Hyoza or Chungjin and gathered a lot of evidences and sent it to the central government. And they examined it and decide, decide whether or not to uh, put them in in Hengshil or not. So is that 
Uh, what do you, you might to like like do you might to like share some like resources because I cannot find the resources of what you're talking about like about how to selecting your low yeah, yeah 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 of course uh, just you can email me oh and, great thank you so yeah, much yeah. thank you so much yeah I will uh if I may I can uh, also yeah there's the email address on chat box. Uh, so if you have further questions to uh, Song Hee, you can certainly uh, reach out to her. And I guess, uh, so we are about time to uh, wrap up this uh, Zoom talk. So on behalf of the Joseon History Society, I thank uh, Song Hee again for presenting this uh, thought provoking uh, research. I really enjoyed uh, hearing from it and also the conversation we had after presentation. And I also want to thank uh, every participant uh, in today's Zoom meeting, uh, participating from all around the world and uh, making this uh, event uh, alive. And we encourage everyone to continue uh, your interests on our Joseon History Society events, uh, sending thoughts and ideas, uh, suggestions. And we already received uh, numerous uh, constructive uh, suggestions and proposals of which uh, we are, are working on currently. And uh, please uh, be a speaker and participant of this uh, event uh, by making more contributions, uh, by sharing your up-to-date research. So if you have uh, any thoughts or uh, if you want to continue some chat with uh, Song Hee, you can remain in the Zoom uh, meeting uh, when the recording is over. Uh, and she's also reachable from email and uh, as for other information about the Joseon History Society, I also, uh, We'll leave the link for our YouTube channel and our, our website, Children History Society website, in case uh, you're interested in. So please visit these uh, places. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again in the future events. Thanks again uh, for joining. And the former part of today's uh, Zoom event is now uh, over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.